That's great. Everything just went quiet all of a sudden when I got up here. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome to the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Uh, for those of you visiting the first time, our school, and to uh, many citizens of the Shar School, I'm delighted that you're here. I'm Mark Roselle. I serve as the dean of the Shar School. Um, we host the programs in biodefense. Uh, this program is celebrating its 15th anniversary, so this is a celebratory occasion with our uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Cadlick. Thank you for coming this evening. For those who don't know about the Shar School, we are one of 10 schools and colleges at George Mason University. Uh, we're about 2,000 students on both campuses in Fairfax and also here in Arlington. Uh, we have a variety of professional degree programs and fields such as international security studies, transportation studies, as well as biodefense and uh, core programs such as public policy, public administration, political science. And here in Arlington, we primarily provide uh, graduate professional education, particularly our master's degree professional programs uh, that are largely offered late afternoons and evenings. So many of our students are working professionals who are uh, doing their graduate professional degrees part-time. The Shar School is a relatively new school. Uh, there used to be a school of public policy. We uh, merged with another large academic unit, Public International Affairs, created what is really a unique policy and government school. Uh, you'll note that at almost all universities in the United States, the um, political science unit, international affairs are completely separated from the graduate professional policy professional programs. We saw that these are very close cousins to each other. They have a lot to offer each other to reinforce the educational experiences of our students at all levels and on both campuses and decided to bring our faculties together, uh, which has created really a lot of energy and much stronger programs here uh, in the Shar School. And as a result, we've really climbed in a variety of rankings. Uh, I'm delighted to report that uh, one that just came out last year, US News and World Report, which seems to be the ranking entity that almost everybody turns to all the time um, uh, for their reviews of the you know, relative standings of different programs and universities around the nation. Uh, but they ranked us third in the country in the field of national security and homeland security studies. Uh, right behind some place called Harvard. Um, so we're coming after them, you know, to take their number two spot uh, next time, I hope. Uh, but that's, you know, in part, I think, due to the combination of our studies in international affairs, international security studies, which is one of our degree programs, and biodefense, and then much of what we're doing in the, in the territory of homeland security as well. Uh, we've developed a distinctive reputation in these areas as, as particular strengths uh, here in the Shar School. So um, congratulations to the Biodefense Program uh, for its 15th anniversary. Uh, we look forward to the big celebration 15 years now from now for the uh, 30th, I guess, or maybe we can do this every five or something. We can, uh, we, we can mark occasions in five-year sequences or, so, or something. And thanks to Greg Koblenz, our, our program director, um, who's been running this successful program for some years now and, um, and is responsible really for, you know, our, our program here this evening. So I would like now to introduce the president of the Shar School Alumni Chapter, uh, Colin Hart. Uh, Colin has taken the reins of the Alumni Association, which has been uh, very, very active in the programming of the Shar School, for which I'm very grateful because they do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Um, but they do it because they like us. They got their degree here, and then they want to come back and show their appreciation and just work for us once in a while. So, uh, Colin, thank you for that. Hello, good evening. I'm Colin Hart. I'm the president of the alumni chapter for the Shar School of Policy and Government. I'm really happy to be here. It's a pleasure always to help out with these events and participate. I was thrilled when uh, Professor Koblenz asked uh, the alumni chapter to be a part of this. We're always very happy to participate and provide an avenue for uh, those who once were students, now alumni. Uh, we are 16,000 strong. 
uh, which is a long way from the day I graduated in 1993 when the Shar School didn't really exist in its current building or form. So it's come quite a long way. Uh, the events here are uh, something that we're very proud of, and I think it brings together folks from uh, the different programs that you could attend at uh, George Mason University, but it also provides a very easy place to get back together for all of us alumni and to listen to fascinating presentations that I hope you'll enjoy today. I do hope that the, um, the uh, influenza anniversary still stays at 100 and 101, 102, so I'm very happy that the biochem program is celebrating its 15th anniversary, and, and I hope we have many more of those, but the influenza one, and I hope we hear a little bit about that at some point, um, I hope it stays a long way in the, in the rear view mirror, uh, considering what it did to the, the world population at that time. With uh, no further ado, uh, Craig, if you would talk up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean Rizal. Thank you, Colin. Uh, and thanks to everyone who came out today to uh, listen to our distinguished speaker speak about the uh, current threats uh, and challenges to, to biodefense that we're facing uh, today. Uh, the biodefense community is, uh, this year, is marking a special anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the 1918 flu, uh, which uh, there have been multiple articles and documentaries about uh, this year where people are trying to uh, draw lessons from the past for how do we prevent the next novel strain of influenza from spreading around the world and causing another global health catastrophe? Uh, but this year also marks another uh, anniversary that to me is very important, uh, which is the 15th anniversary of the biodefense program. In 2003, George Mason University established uh, the first program in this country dedicated to the study of defenses against deliberate biological threats. And in the 15 years since then, the program has evolved uh, to uh, uh, deal with the changes in the changing nature of conflict, the emerging uh, infectious diseases, advances in science and technology, and the impact of globalization. Um, in the, the new national biodefense strategy that our, our speaker had a very important role in, in shaping, the strategy recognizes a collaborative, multi-sectoral, and transdisciplinary approach is the key to effectively countering biological threats. Those same principles are in the DNA of the biodefense program. The program takes a multidisciplinary educational approach uh, to providing our students with the knowledge and skills they need in order to bridge that gap between the science and policy and operate the nexus of the life sciences, public health, and national security at the local, national, and global levels. And I'm very happy to report the state of the biodefense program here at Mason is strong. We have over 60 active uh, students enrolled uh, in our master's and PhD programs. Uh, we have uh, an impressive roster of full-time and adjunct faculty, uh, and we have a very strong track record uh, providing uh, new opportunities for our students uh, to establish uh, careers in the field of biodefense. Uh, this ranges from uh, giving them opportunities to write for our blog, the Pindor Report, uh, sending them to attend the ASM Biothreats Conference uh, every year, or more, more recently, uh, sending some of our students to Uganda and to Bali to attend the Global Health Security Agenda ministerial meetings, uh, which has been an amazing opportunity for them. And our students are thriving. Four of our PhD students have uh, turned their dissertations into books. Another of our PhD students uh, received two awards for her dissertation on the role of global aviation in, uh, as a disease vector. Uh, and for the last three years in a row, we've had biodefense students accepted into uh, the very prestigious uh, Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity Fellowship that's sponsored by the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins University. There are now more than 300 alumni from our program uh, working for a range of federal, state, and local agencies in academia, in the private sector, in the nonprofit communities, uh, around uh, the country and across the world. And I couldn't be more proud of all of you. To help us celebrate the 15th anniversary of the biodefense program and to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the influenza pandemic, uh, I couldn't think of anyone more qualified than tonight's distinguished speaker. Uh, Dr. Robert Cadlick has had a, a, a long and, and high impact career in the field of biodefense that spans three decades of service. Uh, you can find his bio in the program, uh, which is very long, so I will not uh, uh, go through it uh, entirely. Uh, but regardless of whether he was working at the Pentagon, on Capitol Hill, or in the White House, uh, Dr. Cadillac played a key role uh, in many of the, the seminal events in U.S. biodefense policy uh, for the last many decades. During the 1990s, he was a BW inspector for UNSCOM. In 2001, at the time of the anthrax letter attacks and 9-11, uh, he was a special advisor to the Secretary of Defense on counterproliferation policy. Uh, from there, he moved to the White House, where he was uh, Director of Biodefense for the Homeland Security Council, 
and he helped craft this country's first biodefense strategy. He then moved on to the Senate, where he uh, played a key role in writing the uh, Pandemics and All Hazard Preparedness Act. This legislation provides the foundation for our public health and medical emergency preparedness and response capabilities uh, even uh, today. And now in his current position as the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response at HHS, uh, he was a key architect in uh, the newly released National Biodefense Strategy. And his office is in charge of overseeing implementation of that, tr of that uh, strategy across the US government. So uh, you didn't come here to hear me talk. So um, I would like to welcome, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Kadlik to the stage. Thank you very much, Greg. Really, really a pleasure. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a real honor to be here. Uh, Dean Roselle, Colin, thank you so much for your opening remarks and, again, acknowledging the quality of this program. I'm sure you're going to take over uh, Harvard here soon, so I'll be rooting for you. Uh, but I also want to say, uh, um, and the very kind and generous uh, uh, introduction by uh, Professor Goblentz, I, I also have to say, just say, uh, 30 years, geez, I didn't think I was that old. <laughs> uh, but also the other thing I, I, I just want to caution and I just to reassure him is that anything that I say that is contrary to what Professor Koblenz says, he's right. So for any of his students or that. But I think the other thing to point out, and it was uh, asked to me prior to coming into this auditorium uh, by, uh, by your, uh, your public affairs person was, what is, why does this really matter? What is so important about this program that really matters? And I think the key thing is, is uh, there's certainly the quantity issue, 300 graduates over the 15 years and the 60 that are currently enrolled, uh, but it's really about the quality of the program that has always struck me. And in my uh, uh, kind of wanderings uh, around government and out there, uh, I've run into your graduates. Uh, and again, have been have, have admired the the quality and and intellect that they come with, and the grounding they have in a very uh, very dynamic discipline that literally is uh, moving at the speed of uh, I would say uh, DNA at this point uh, in the speed of science. So it is really a pleasure to be here. I've kind of constructed my comments in a way that I think hopefully will be entertaining as well as educational. Uh, it's to recognize uh, the denouement of all this. We'll be talking about the latest national biodefense strategy, but really to understand the evolution of this in the United States. Uh, because in some ways, uh, we'll be surprised by some of the contours, the stops and starts. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that in some ways, we ended at this point in time for a very specific reason, which is uh, the efforts of many people over not only decades, but centuries of effort. Uh, that basically have laid the groundwork for this. As to the prediction about the pandemic being in 102 or whatever, 103 years, well, the, the unfortunate thing is, is there were like four in the 20th century. Obviously, the 1918 one was the particularly severe one. Uh, but certainly, um, the only thing we can count on with any surety is that there'll be another one probably in our lifetime. And, and pray it isn't as severe as 1918 because the world is much different than it was then and some of the challenges that we would be confronted with uh, in terms of dealing with something of that nature would be extraordinary, even under the best of circumstances. So we'll start off at the very beginning. Uh, what is biodefense? So I, I don't think I have to, there's no quiz, don't worry. Um, but I think the key thing here, and the difference particularly with this latest biodefense strategy from the one that was created or crafted in 2004 during the, the Bush administration is, is that this deals with the full spectrum of bio incidents. So those that are which uh, would be considered deliberate, bio warfare, bioterrorism, those that may be criminal in nature, and I, I don't know, did Seth get here tonight? I don't know if, there he is in the back. Hey Seth, because you wrote a great piece on bio criminals uh, in, your, in, your, um, in your time. Um, but it's also this idea that there may be a natural event that will, can happen, but in today's world, because of the access to the tools of biotechnology, and life sciences, there's a good chance that we have a, an accident. And, and this is particularly, uh, I think, a stark kind of reminder when we talk about things like gain of function experiments that are being conducted to basically evaluate, hey, can we basically uh, determine what are the determinants, if you will, of what would make a influenza virus that's virulent highly transmissible, for example. And so these are all relevant things and quite quite frankly, the kinds of things 
I think Greg and Professor Koblenz and his colleagues here have been struggling with to convey to a, a growing body of, of graduates and students to say these are things that cannot be legislated about, they can't be regulated about, uh, you can't criminalize it all because they're a fundamental, vital part of what will be a huge bioeconomy in the 21st century that if you read today's New York Times, they talked about how they are on the verge of curing sickle cell disease by using these techniques of DNA, CRISPR-Cas9, and also vectors that basically will transfect individuals to overcome genetic deficiencies that will cure these diseases that quite for, uh, beforehand has never been, uh, been able to be managed, much less treated or cured. So this is a, a kind of a point to just say, this all started way back when. Uh, in some other four, I've used this as kind of a, like a Jeopardy question. Who is the first president involved in biodefense? Uh, but I think for today's purposes, we'll, we'll save that to later in the, in the conversation. But the key thing here is this has been around as long as the United States or our colonies were around in dealing with diseases that impacted not only the social fabric of the country, but also its national security. And so for those who don't know that uh, George Washington basically used variolation. How many people know what variolation is? You have a hand, good, pretty good number, but I'll just repeat it for those who haven't. For those people who have had smallpox, they get pustules, they're very unsightly, but also highly infectious. And so what they would do is recover some of that material from the pus laden vesicles, uh, basically dry it, ground it up, and then give it to people who haven't been exposed to smallpox to basically snuff it or sniff it like you would do snuff with the intention that that would provide some kind of immunity. So this was before Jenner and vaccination, but the key thing is it worked. Unfortunately, for about three to 5% of the people who are variolated, they may get smallpox and die. That's the downside. But George Washington made the affirmative decision during an outbreak uh, during uh, the American Revolutionary War that he would variolate the uh, Continental Army to prevent the impact of that smallpox disease on his ability to fight uh, the British at that time. But really, between Washington and probably FDR, there was a big hiatus. A lot was going on in science, obviously developments there, but it was really FDR that probably had the most critical role in the modern biodefense policy business, which quite frankly was a bluff. So um, at the advent of World War II, or prior to World War II, there was a lot of legitimate concern about whether or not biowarfare would be something that would be used in a future war. Obviously, during World War I, gas warfare was used uh, with some effect, tactical, operational. You could argue whether there was strategic effect or not. But the point is, there were a lot of people who were affected by it, impacted a lot of troops, and had a residual effect on folks that was memorable, obviously. But it was really the concern that, unfortunately, our intelligence community was wrong, uh, not again, but was wrong in this case to believe that Germany had an offensive PW program, which they had some R&D that they were doing, but Japan did not. And quite reality was the exact opposite. And so either way, the fact that the, the policy was driven on maybe some wrongful intelligence, it was the idea, though, that FDR basically made a declaratory policy that said that any use of poison gases that included both chemical and biological would result in the perpetrators getting the equal and full swift retaliation in kind. The reality is we had a chemical program, but we didn't have a bioweapons program at that time. So a bit of a bluff on his part. But it wasn't a bluff without a meaning or intention to basically correct. So we know who knew who the father of the U.S. WMD program nuclear was, right? It was Oppenheimer. So can anybody tell me who the man uh, in the civilian suit with the nice shorty tie is? Um, some of you may have seen this picture before, and I'll, I'll exclude you from this. There are no prizes today, unfortunately. But, but anybody that knows that gentleman? Well, that is the father of the US biological weapons program. You mo may own stock in his company. You may have taken some of his medicines, even his vaccines, because it was George Merck. So at that time, a program that was equivalent uh, in effort uh, and involved some of the top biologists in the United States at that time, including George Merck, basically were given the task to create biological weapons to retaliate in kind. Now, at the end of their effort in 1945, 
uh, they were not entirely successful. Uh, what they were successful in doing was actually getting a number of researchers sick, some of them dying from the diseases that they were investigating for the purposes of bioweapons, but the reality is, is they were not able to prove that it could be used as a weapon. Now, that's kind of important to know, and it's kind of important to know that it was his report that was published back in January 1946 was originally unclassified, but later classified because it created a lot of public concern and stir in magazines like Time and Newsweek because it raised a specter of this kind of germ warfare that really kind of freaked people out. So it again highlighted some of the effects, the indirect effects of germ warfare in the sense of it really represented a basic primal fear in people, particularly in America, where we were overcoming the, the scourge of diseases because of vaccines, because of antibiotics, that somehow someone would use those deliberately. But it was something that really got, that piqued people's interest. So this was classified and then, again, later worked on. But I think if you had to look through it and you look at the Truman period, which kind of, if you will, propagated what FDR did with the deterrence theory, it was Eisenhower kind of made the big shift. A couple reasons why. One is, um, uh, oh, and I should say, uh, and this is an important note, and in, in no doubt it will be a, it's a su subject of Professor Koblenz's uh, conversations in his class, is one of the outcomes of the efforts or the failed efforts of World War II was that no one thought it would work, but it was believed that there would have to be some kind of human testing. So the Department of Defense, back in the 19, late 1940s, decided to start Operation White Coat, which was actually a program to infect Seventh-day Adventist conscientious objectors uh, to a variety of incapacitating biological agents uh, with the intent to understand their effects both in laboratory settings and field settings. And it was one of those tests in 1954 that was really kind of like a major shift point. Why? Because they took a company of soldiers, about 100 people, out in the fields of Dugway, released brucella, infected them in a simulated combat environment, and demonstrated that those people would get sick. And then it became more of a plausible scenario to believe that we, the United States, could basically use this in warfare. What compounded some of the interest in this is what uh, happened in 1956 when uh, General Zukov stated that in any future war with its adversary, which was the United States, that both chemical and biological weapons would be used. Now this is where personality and relationships matter. Eisenhower knew Zukov. He it was his counterpart during World War II and knew the guy wasn't a bluffer. And so it was Eisenhower then, at that point, shifted the U.S. policy to say, hmm, these things work. Uh, we believe uh, that the Russians or the Soviets will use them, so we should be prepared to use them if it benefits us. And I'll make that decision because I'm a retired five-star general who can beat me, and I'm the commander-in-chief and president of the United States. What's interesting in that period of time is a lot of effort and a lot of serious thought about the offensive use of these weapons. One of the interesting things about the intelligence at that time was the belief or the assessment by the United States that Russia, in fact, had started its offensive BW program about 10 years earlier from the United States, meaning in the 1930s, and that there was a qualitative and probably quantitative advantage to the Soviets at that time. So there was a bit of, of a germ a germ race. Remember the missile, the, you know, the missile race? But there was also the view that there was some kind of competition between the United States and the Soviet Union on this. And so there was a lot of serious study on this. What's interesting from a 1960 uh, top secret eyes only National Security Council meeting when Eisenhower was briefed on the feasibility of this, he was, he was, he was confronted with the idea that there may be the way to fight a new kind of warfare particularly in low intensity conflict settings where we could use these weapons against personnel who were not protected, didn't have vaccines or chemical protection equipment, and they could be mixed in with friendlies and incapacitating them would allow us to come in and sort the good from the bad and take care of the bad. Uh, but he also realized that if these weapons were ever used, even incapacitating weapons against the Soviets, it would probably result in something uh, that would probably be a very bad outcome, which mean is they would retaliate in kind with lethal weapons or with nuclear weapons. So he understood that there was an escalatory kind of circumstance here that, uh, quite frankly, had to be confronted. To give you an idea, this just gives you a sense of what 
they were able to do back in the late 50s with a liquid agent. So this is an extract from a 1959 summary from the U.S. Army Chemical Corps that basically demonstrated what a single sortie could do using a uh, liquid agent. And I think in this case it was a model over Q fever where a single aircraft could basically cover 50,000 mile, square miles. And that if you use three aircraft at certain uh, altitudes and speeds, you could basically do 150,000 square miles. The key thing here is there was an appreciation in the 50s that biological weapons weren't equivalent to nuclear weapons in terms of city busters. They could be. But it was this whole idea that you could actually use them for nation busters. And so at the end of the program in the 1960s, we had quantities of materials, mostly incapacitating agents, that could be used to basically out take literally countries out. And so in one case, um, it was a circumstance that we had enough material on hand that we could basically eliminate, uh, not eliminate, basically cover maybe three Eastern Bloc countries, which was significant, you can imagine, in terms of basically incapacitating 50% of the cap uh, population that way. But what was the interesting fact about that is that there was no such thing as an incapacitating agent. And that would figure prominently in the NSC debate with Nixon in 1969, because it was recognized that about 1% of the population that would be exposed to these agents, even incapacitating, would likely result in death. And so that was only affecting the children and elderly. So in the case of what we had on hand, <laughs> the modeling suggested that they could kill 300,000 children and old people if they ever used these weapons in war. So, as Melvin Laird said and Kissinger, you know, commented later, that these were far from incapacitating agents when you had had that many people, particularly innocents, that would succumb to these kinds of agents. Went through a very thoughtful and considered program to figure out how they could do this, particularly for large area coverage. You may ask, how good was the science? Well, the American Society of Microbiology and its predecessor, the uh, Bacterial Society of America, or BSA, not the Boy Scouts of America, but the Bacteriological Scientists of America, uh, 20 of their presidents served in some capacity in the program. So this is not a far cry from what we saw in the nuclear side of the program, our nuclear weapons program, when the tellers and all those other people were part of that program. What's interesting is, is there was a very active exchange between the scientific community and the bioweapons community in this time frame that really had to do with a very significant thing, which is cited here, that they were asked to come in on some reasonable frequent basis, usually quarterly, to address problems, and they were not responsible for any of the moral, political, or military aspects of BW. That was a different era, right? You know, in terms of not linking the moral with the science, with the kind of outcome of what the the effort was, but it was clearly the circumstance that uh, for a time there were many people who contributed to this program. Why? Because they thought it was a deterrence to the Soviets. But as you can see, the military was seeing the benefits of what you could use these weapons and how you could use these weapons in different ways. Interesting enough, this committee was dissolved in 1968. Why? Nothing to do with bioweapons, but everything to do with Agent Orange. Because at Fort Detrick, and part of the BW program was the defoliant program, the herbicides. 2,4-T, 2,4-5-T, and 2,4-D were the two agents that made Agent Orange. And that was something that was a, a product of that uh, complex up there. And that did create a lot of consternation within the public community and the scientific community. And that really did lead to the end of this kind of discussion. So this gentleman here was the head director of the bioweapons program, both the offensive and defensive. Interesting enough, during his tenure at Fort Detrick, which uh, spanned 14 years, he served as the president of the American Society of Microbiology. And from his archives, we learned that, again, their whole intent was to basically uh, trans translate policy into reality and develop capabilities that would theoretically deter our enemies, but also work on defensive measures as well. So here's some of the things that uh, they were trying to achieve from a strategic policy objectives. Strategic deterrence, which was about lethal agents, and developing them in a way prior to the events of genetic engineering in ways that you had multi-antibiotic uh, resistant and vaccine resistant strains of tularemia, anthrax, and plague. Uh, and then you had these rapidly acting incapacitating agents of a variety of kinds and, and circumstances. And again, this whole purpose was 
that you could use these incapacitants in ways that you could not use other agents uh, um, in, in low intensity conflict settings. So from an operational standpoint, however, the people up at Fort Detrick, the scientists there, were very interested to, to use non-endemic diseases, to use non-primary routes of exposure, use overwhelming doses, and again, confer resistance to conventional treatments. And so here's just an example. Uh, how many people have served in the Pentagon? Got a few here. OK, great. So this is a document from 1965. You can't read it very well. I'll read the element that is relevant here. But the thing you have to have great confidence is, and back in September 1965, that the letterhead for the Joint Chiefs of Staff has not changed. <laughs> but this document, which was written, and it was written as a response to the President's uh, FY 1967 budget, uh, and we had the opportunity, when I say we, uh, Professor Roman and I, Peter Roman and I, had the opportunity to interview Harold Brown, who was the head of DDNR and E then, at that time later became Secretary of Defense, remembered this, the contents of this particular document at the age of like 93. Just amazing. But what's said in the, the last paragraph of this thing besides uh, paragraph six, which talks about chem weapons, chem bio weapon systems, and talks about their, the need to develop in hardware to basically enable certain operational scenarios. And then B, it basically talks about the use of these potential weapons in Southeast Asia, meaning Vietnam. The last paragraph is the one that has the most, I think, significance in today's world, which basically says, in light of what may happen as a result of the degeneration of our nuclear strategic system, as a result of ABM technology, ballistic missile defense, Biolized, strategic biological weapons uh, systems are a strategic possibility. So if you look at the asymmetric benefit of bio in some ways, and they were looking at it from the use of special operation forces, cruise missiles, and drones, interesting enough, that some of this historical perspective has some value today as we look at some of our adversaries and how they may perceive our national missile defense and how they may perceive asymmetric advantages to some of these capabilities. So LBJ is the beginning of the end. Uh, but even so, even after the, uh, the, uh, the, the 1963 nuclear test ban treaty that said we can't do any outside open air testing, we were conducting open air testing with live biological agents in the Pacific. These were things called Shady Grove. I'm sure they've been a matter of con uh, conversation in some of the classes. But the point is, we were doing large area testing which served twofold purposes. One is to perfect the weapon system, how we could use it to be a nation, nation buster, because we're literally covering 50,000 square miles or more with live agents. The second thing was evaluating the effects of those agents on a variety of living fauna and uh, flora to understand what would be the consequence of these things. And this has a significance uh, going forward, as well as conducting a series of covert vul vulnerability tests which was really to assess how vulnerable we were as a nation. So they attacked the Pentagon multiple times. Didn't work, unfortunately. I mean, it did work, a few simulants. But the point is, is they attacked a variety of different systems. You can probably recall there was the New York subway, city, subway tests. Uh, there were a variety of tests that were done that basically demonstrated that if somebody wanted to use this against us, that that would have extraordinary uh, bad effects. And so in 1968, uh, there, he signs the defense planning memorandum terminating the Letha program. I wish I could tell you more, but it's sitting in the classified s stacks of the LBJ Memorial uh, Library down in uh, Austin, Texas. But I think that's one of the, the pieces of the history that would be nice to know. Why did he eliminate that? Now, um, we do know that Richard Nixon um, basically signed this executive order, and this is, gets to the more modern period of biodefense policy. So a month before Nixon eliminates bioweapons, he signs an executive order about putting uh, HEW in charge of the prevention, detection, and identification uh, of human exposure of chemical and biological agents, and basically puts the onus of responsibility for civilian biodefense on HEW. Well, if you do any bioforensics, or I shouldn't say that, uh, bureau bureaucratic forensics, uh, slip of the tongue there. Bio uh, bureaucratic forensics about this, you'll see there is no. I mean, it was like it was not even a blip on the screen. 
So in terms of what that resulted, and it's kind of like a policy conversation saying, executive orders, I, as I commonly call them, are called spitwads. Because in, in terms of what their value is and what their meaning is and what their weight is, is really kind of dependent on how much the president at that time devotes the resources to basically activate this. So there is really very little that you see in terms of what came out of that. But what did come 30 days later was the National Security Council decision to basically say, why the heck do we have these things? And I know why that happened. It's because Melvin Laird was briefed on what we had on hand, realized that it was a weapon that would kill innocents, wrote literally the next day to Henry Kissinger said, we need a policy review of these weapon systems because I just don't think they're worth a damn. I'm, I'm using his, not his words, I'm using my words, but conveying the, the tone of the letter. Um, but it's the point though that it was recognized that a couple of things came out of this is, in some ways the, the effects were latent, some of the effects, the latent, the effects were, uh, were kind of, uh, uh, were difficult to predict, but a week later from this meeting, um, he decided that we're gonna end the program. What's interesting is that House Wright, if you remember the guy who ran the technical side of the program, wrote a four-page memo that basically outlined what were the conclusions out of our experience. So in May, before that fateful policy decision by Nixon, basically codified what, what I would say are four major points. It's a strategic weapon, primarily directed against civilians and economic targets. Interesting enough, in that time, if you look at the, the scientific advisors the PCAS report on this, the scientists, the, the scientists advising Nixon also believed that this was not a mil military valuable weapon because you could use it once, but after that happened, the military would wear its gas mask, would immunize, would do a whole certain uh, series of things that would mitigate the effects. But civilian populations and economic targets, particularly agricultural targets, were not so protected or not so beneficial. The other thing is that through their tests they did, is that these area, that these tests demonstrated that damn stuff worked too well. That it covered these areas with, uh, not only covered the areas they intended, but went far beyond what they expected. Uh, and it also was very difficult to confine the effects of these things. By their very nature, these are not natural diseases. So if someone tries to convey to you, and I did that too, was saying, well, you know, these, this is a lesser included case of you know natural emerging diseases. It ain't because quite frankly, the epidemiology of this is entirely different. <laughs> Why is that so? Because you blanket an area, and this is what the outside, outdoor test proved, that basically every living thing in that area was infected. And if it didn't die, it became a reservoir for disease. And so in many ways, the issues of contamination, in terms of like surface contamination, were not an issue insofar as that it was one thing that that would be degraded by ultraviolet light, but it's another thing if you have rodents, reptiles, insects that are still carrying or transmitting these diseases that they would pose a hazard to human health. And so that's a very different kind of residual contamination issue than I think we talk about. They called it the total ecologic threat. And then the last thing is, which is kind of like well, maybe a duh statement, and that is if you rely on intelligence, you're gonna be really wrong. And so part of this is, and this becomes an important element ultimately in the BWC, the Biological Weapons Convention, which is a carve out that says, you know, you, you know, you can use these products of these agents for peaceful and prophylactic means. You can use them for defense. And that was one of the points that was made not only by House Wright, but also during the NSC meeting where Nixon basically said we need to do this. So what does, uh, what does this look like? I think some of you have seen this before. But in today's world, um, when you think about what the economic effects of these kinds of weapons are in a civilian environment, independent of the loss of a life, the fact is they have a huge cost on any place if you had a large area release. That does not include the fact that you'd have to do the wildlife kind of cleanup. This is just the idea that it would be very difficult to repopulate these areas once they were abandoned. How do we know this? The Council of Economic Advisors did a study for the president and uh, in 2008 that basically indicated that the cost of, 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 of a city being attacked with anthrax would be about $1.8 trillion in the first six months. Why the first six months? 
because they could only calculate it for the first six months. Because after six months, real estate owners who own commercial buildings in those areas said if they couldn't clean up and repopulate those buildings, they were gonna abandon them. So you can imagine what would be the circumstance if you had to abandon the city. That would be a huge uh, uh, impact of these things, regardless of how many people you kill. So I just wanna talk to you about, um, it's just kind of uh, maybe convenient, but also uh, 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 a circumstance of today's events that uh, President uh, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush experienced probably the closest thing to a near miss with biological weapons. And this may not have been uh, well categorized or carried forth, but I saw Charlie Delfer in the audience. So if I say something wrong, Charlie, please let me know and I'll, I'll correct it right away. But the point here is one of the interesting things that was learned well after the first Gulf War and even the second Gulf War that the Iraqis were preparing for not only invading Kuwait, but the use of bioweapons prior to the invasion. So they started the surge production in 1990. And that Saddam gave release authority for the use of BW in December of 1990, which was a month before the actual prosecution of the war. But he had given the release authority. And that they had dispersed bioweapons to airfields in Iraq in, uh, as liquid agent, primarily anthrax, to be used at the onset of a war. And the good news is, the hero of this story is uh, the good old US Air Force that basically ensured that uh, at the start of the war that nothing flew from this, the Iraqi side, certainly nothing of this nature, and was able to preempt them in a way that, quite frankly, we didn't know that existed until well after the war. Am I square on that, Charlie? Charles, not said Jeff, thank you. But here's the, here's the point, though, what it could have meant. So this was the disposition of US forces in December 1990. This was the primary uh, climactic conditions, again, favorable for Baghdad if they ever wanted to use these weapons, uh, certainly from their own territory going south into Saudi Arabia, into Kuwait. And something that was found in the famous chicken coop documents was this video that indicated a, a test that was conducted by the Iraqis in January of 1991 before the, the air war started where they're disseminating an, air, uh, an anthrax simulant uh, from a F1 Mirage. You can barely make out what would be a, I don't know if this thing is working or not, I don't want to laze myself, but, um, but barely see that cloud behind the tail of the aircraft. So the point is, is that they were prepared to use it. It was credible. We didn't know fully about this threat. We knew they had their some capabilities, but again, it was a, a near miss. Now, what would have happened if they were able to launch one aircraft? One aircraft could have basically covered an area of this nature um, could have resulted in significant numbers of casualties. At that time, the U.S. military and our allies didn't have quantity sufficient of, of any vaccine, much less the anthrax vaccine. Uh, and so it would have had wreaked a lot of havoc as well as killed a lot of civilians. Now, whose slides are these? They're not my slides. They're Secretary William Perry's slides that he presented to the NATO defense secretaries in 1996, indicating what could have happened and what didn't happen, fortunately, and why it was still an interest of the United States and the world to ensure that we get a, a, an effective declaration and uh, verification of what happened to Iraq's BW program. Because up to that point, they were pretty good at chicanery. Uh, they denied it initially, and then they deceived it, and then they, even under the most you know intensive uh, inspection measures ever designed by man, under 687, they were able to elude a lot of the, the prohibitions and evade a lot of things uh, to no one's satisfaction. So here's your Jeopardy moment. In 1993, which president said this? Any guesses? Clinton. Clinton. How about Saddam Hussein? He had a pretty good idea what this was about, uh, even though he was preempted, if you will. Um, but even when he was subject to the most onerous UNSCR uh, UN sanctions conceived, he saw what the future was, potentially. Uh, but yet, he was not, if you will, the generator of that future. Now, this is what Bill Clinton did. Uh, and I think significantly in the post Gulf War scenario, one of the odd things that developed is, is that 
uh, Department of Defense got religion on these issues, created a counterproliferation office, focused a lot of spending and efforts to basically improve military defensive measures for bio defense for the military. But quite frankly, the civilian side during this period of time was kind of latent, except for three things at least that um, have been identified. One is uh, the realization of the former Soviet Union's BW program, how large and extensive it was, and the proliferation risks it may have posed. The impact of the Josh Lederberg letter that warned the president that we were on the verge of a new era where, as he said, a biological buffoon could kill 300,000 people. And of course, Robert Preston's Cobra event, uh, which was public literature. So it kind of an interesting confluence of events, but I think mobilized what would say the public psyche and congressional psyche to do this. But again, it was really focused on the military side of the problem. Now you'll see that the president signed, uh, directed $300 million for biodefense preparedness, for biosurveillance, and the creation of a national stockpile. I am the current steward of the stockpile. And he guesses how much it's worth. $7 billion. Its annual budget is about $600 million bucks a year, which is probably um, about $300 million underfunded. Uh, but it's no insignificant thing. Why? Because there's been the greater appreciation post 9-11, particularly the anthrax letter events, that this is a civilian, a, a greater civilian problem than it is a military problem. So here's another chance for a winner. Prior to 9-11, which president wrote this? So I'll just highlight a few points here. We need to stockpile antibiotics. Uh, we need to deploy sensors. This is uh, two years before BioWatch was uh, was created. We need to keep close eye on the former Soviets. And we need to prepare for a possibility attack because uh, they could succeed in blackmailing us. Any guesses? Any guesses? Come on, there's got to be a guess. Anybody? Bush? Any other one? How about Donald Trump? <laughs> you see, biodefense policy is full of surprises. So yes, he did in 2000 wrote this book, What the America We Deserve, and had a, a section on this stuff. So you may um, consider this kind of an oxymoron about this, but you'll see in a minute about the current national biodefense strategy. But I just want to say to you that the whole scope of the modern day events subject to biodefense, particularly after 2001, as I will describe it, has been imperfect incrementalism. We get some things right, we get some things wrong. Congress in the dark letter, I think it's blue or black, um, basically you know, passes laws, a number of them, uh, and red are the things that are from the White House or from national level strategies or presidential documentations. I, th I think the key thing to hear is that we're still kind of zigging and zagging to find the right balance, what is the right thing to do. And, and I think that's one of the great challenges. I think the great opportunities I think for programs like this to have a voice in it. Uh, Professor Koblenz shared with me a, a recent document about some of the work that was done uh, concerning synthetic biology, which is great, quite frankly, because we're struggling to try to put our head around that, right? Either it's the worst possible thing or the best possible thing, and likely it's somewhere in the middle. But the question is, is what do you do about it? What do you do about something that, in the end, can promote the best opportunities to address some of the worst scenarios for this, this world, and not only us, but for the, for the humanity, with regard to disease, food, energy? I mean, just go down the list. And so if we can kind of work with each other on this kind of scope of challenges to make sure we can use it for the benefit and not for the nefarious, uh, we'll be all better for it. So quick WD, uh, WMD biodefense strategy mapping. Uh, this is just basically kind of quickly kind of des describes the evolution through the Bush years. You know, again, when I say Bush 43, Obama, with uh, some of the, the documentation on the side, HSBD-10, the biodefense bio strategy, PPD-2, the strategy for countering biological threats, and a number of other biological uh, directives. So biodefense strategy 2004, HSPD-10, <coughs> focus on deliberate events. Basically, here was the framework, prevent, protect, surveil, detect, 
respond and recover. PPD2 was saying, well, how do we balance it? And realize the previous strategy was really focusing on our response capabilities. What can we do to, sur to, to surveil and detect these events and then rapidly respond? Heavily weighted to that domain. The Obama administration said, yeah, that's OK. That's all right, but we also need to balance what we can do to counter these things before they get to be problems. And so it was an appropriate rebalancing of the strategy to acknowledge that there's some things that we can do that would be beneficial. Global health security, the global health security agenda, reinforcing norms, you know, providing you know, information sharing. And so th this is kind of like, again, this incremental pr process that we've been confronted with, which is good. And, and so now we're led to this point in time. Uh, I wasn't Photoshopped in this. And, and, and contrary to pop, popular belief, the person who deserves all the credit for this is that young lady on the far right, Hillary Carter, who did the lion's share of the work with a lot of people from my organization. I'm going to give a name here that many people don't know, Captain Teresa Lawrence from my organization and her colleague who's here. Where are you? There you are. You deserve credit, too to basically acknowledge the fact that we put together, we, and I, now I'm doing the royal we, they basically put together a strategy that quite frankly is something long awaited and overdue. Why? Because I'll explain it to you in a minute. But the point here, President Trump signed it. I think he, uh, as some people describe him as a germaphobe, maybe, but I think he appreciates the benefits, because what's interesting about the strategy, two things. Who's read it here? Now, this is the question. All right, there's some people read it. What strikes me about the strategy, it talks about not only the issues and the risks, but also the opportunities, particularly as it relates to the benefits to the economy. How, if we can do this right, if we can promote this the right way, we can grow our economy as well as protect ourselves. And, and so that is, that's an interesting kind of dynamic that's inserted in this kind of strat strategic document that, quite frankly, is fairly dense, right? I don't know how many pages it is, but it's a bunch. You know, I have to, I have to, had to kind of read it in small bites. And, uh, but the point here is, is that's an, an interesting set of uh, opportunities. And so what that does is basically knock out all these other things that have historically been involved and replaces it with five principal goals. How do we do risk awareness? And so this is part of this is intelligence. Part of it is threat characterization or the science. The other part of it is what do we do to prevent this? And so it try to balance this all out. It basically says, how do we make real efforts to do this in a way that is meaningful in terms of domestically and internationally to reduce the risk, but also to promote the value of what we think is a bioeconomy? And then you get goal three and four, which is about preparedness response. I kind of conflate those two. That's probably a bad thing to say, but I do. And then the last one is how do we recover from these? And so, again, what this strategy does is look at the whole domain of what biodefense is. And so if you read through it, it's a fairly detailed deconstruction based on these five goals of what does it mean to do biodefense in these particular areas. Now, you could say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means is, is that it establishes the framework, and now the onus is on, guess who? Me. I won't say me. Actually, the Secretary of HHS, who's basically give, designated as the lead, not only for the implementation of the strategy, but to conduct a, an assessment to say, how are we doing against these particular areas? So as it stands now, uh, the assistant to the president has directed Secretary of Azar who's directed me to basically stand up this biodefense steering committee to basically look at this, bring the interagency together, and do a fairly detailed inventory. This is not the first time it was done. I think that what's unique about this, it's being done in a very conservative, collaborative, and detailed way that's going to get to the bottom what I think is the essence of this. What are we doing? How effective we are doing it? And oh, by the way, what are we spending on? Because quite frankly, that has been an area of great, uh, not debate, but lack of clarity. And so I think this is going to go a long way. This process, interesting enough, will last six to eight months with the intent, ultimately, to basically produce to the National Security Advisor kind of a report that says, well, here's the state of biodefense today. And with that, it will go into a policy process 
to actually figure out where the puts and takes. So let me just tell you what's a big put and take, just to kind of liven things up here a little bit. What's the, what's the value of global health security agenda as we invest small amounts of money in different countries around the world so they can better manage emerging diseases or the risks of pandemics in their countries? As we witness in Ebola in Western DRC, at least for that part, when we spent that money, basically, they were able to manage it, and again, excluding the security environment, in a way, effectively with WHO, with some US support. And that was the great thing about it, not a lot of money. Versus cooperative threat reduction. How do we secure pathogens that we know now that are not only exist are ubiquitous in the world, but now can be theoretically synthesized de novo as the people up in Canada did with horsebox. So what is the benefit of trying to lock things up when, when quite frankly, we know that there are ways to circumvent that, if you can do it at all to begin with? And so those are some of the puts and takes, I think, from a policy side that are going to be considered and conducted as part of this. And so the answer is, we'll see. But I see this as kind of like a brave new dawn for this. Now, I will say on the bottom line, and some have heard, heard this story before, is that if you look, characterize what we're spending in this area, particularly on the response and preparedness area, you're talking about, about $7 billion. That's a lot of money, right? And that in, doesn't include this, the value of the stockpile, right? That's $7 billion. So maybe it's $14 billion, okay? But even so, you know how much an aircraft carrier costs? $17 billion. And we got 11 of them. That's just the Navy. Doesn't count the B-1 bombers, doesn't include the strategic missiles we have, the Trident, you know, all that other stuff. And so the question here is, hopefully as a consequence of this argument or this, this conversation that's going to happen across the interagency and to respond to Congress, we'll be able to at least justify more directed spending of what we're spending, but also hopefully increased spending to spending what we're not spending on, like pandemic influenza. And so I'm going to close this, my comments, and then open to questions. Uh, if we're good, how we're doing on time, Greg? Doing okay? Um, how do we open, how do we address the issue of pandemic influenza? Well, one thing is we're not very do, very good, I think. I mean, I'll be quite frank with you. I'm kind of responsible for this, but I, I think we have a long way to go. And part of it is, is we've made extraordinary investments, $6.5 billion during the Bush administration that was supplemental funding, one-time funding. Guess what? That money evaporated. And there is now being debated whether we should have a standing authorization for pandemic influenza. You betcha we should, you know, but it, that's not yet in law. And it's certainly not being appropriated against. The other thing is, is regardless of pandemic influenza, let's look what happened last year. 80,000 Americans died in a particularly bad seasonal flu season, right? Um, and that was not because no one guessed right because they finally did. H3N2. They guessed right. They had the strain down. They had the match right. But in the course of producing that on scale through eggs, there was a drift of the vaccine strain that shifted that just so ever so slightly that made it a less effective vaccine. In some cases, the calculations are 17%. I think the jury's still out on that, honestly. But the point is, is that we got to be better in producing faithfully the vaccine strain that we need. Because if that happens during a pandemic, it's not that 80,000 people will die. It'll be 80 million people will die. And so we got to get better in how do we produce things not only uh, better, but also faster. So I mean, it's mind boggling. We've had a series of ex exercises with the government. I participated in one with the deputies just a couple of weeks ago. And it, it's going to take six months to produce enough vaccine. And that's after a 120-day kickstart. So you're going to be well into a pandemic. And the, I can't remember the number of uh, people that would die a day for every day of delay during a, during a pan flu event or during a virulent pan flu event. But it's tens of thousands of people. And so the question is, is you know, what are we willing to, to buy down our risk if we could do it? And so. I mean, that is one of the areas that if you ask Secretary Azar what keeps him up at night, um, and I always joke about that because I, I, I relate to him. I said, sir, I, I had that same problem when I was on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I woke up every two hours screaming and had to change my pants. Uh, 
it's just that the idea that we'd have a pandemic of that nature, whether it be eight, seven, and nine, I mean, it's been kind of a quiet seventh wave or sixth wave right now. But the point is, is that we know there's something behind that because we had, you know, H5N1, we've had H1N1. So we're just primed with the idea that this is gonna happen. And part of this is, is not just simply uh, knowing about it, we'll know when it happens, but how can we react fast enough to basically do this? And by the way, and I'm grateful I see a few people from industry here, is that this ain't a federal government problem. This is a public-private partnership problem, one where we basically become a, a good steward of not only the money from the U.S. Treasury, but work faithfully and, and, and quite frankly, uh, collaboratively with, with industry to make sure we have what we need when we need it. Uh, because it's not fair to, as we saw in some other events, to go to a big vaccine maker saying, make me an Ebola vaccine, and then realize they do it at the goodness of their heart, at the opportunity cost that they have, and then the U.S. government walks away from it because uh, it's done. That's what, that's what happened in 2014. So, so there's more to this kind of challenge than just says, what is the federal government going to do? It's what the federal government is going to do with our private-public partnerships. And what are we going to do to support our state and local authorities who are going to really have to manage these events in the end of the day? But I'm kind of waxing and waning. If you could tell, I was getting a little fired up there. Uh, but it does fire me up because this is something that can happen on my watch. Regardless, it may happen again in my lifetime. And, and by guarantee it, it's going to happen in the lifetime of my children. And I'd like to think that we can leave them a better, safer world if we do some things not only from a policy standpoint, but make wise investments and commit the cerebral power, which I think is resident in a place like this, uh, uh, led by Professor Goblins and his colleagues in the faculty, to basically promote people who are understand these issues, the opportunities to advance the cause, articulate to deal with the policymakers in a way that is credible and scientifically sound to ensure that we pull not only the right policies, but develop and pursue the right programs that in the end result in the right products that we have to use if we ever have to use. So thank you, and have a great evening. <laughs> now we'll become the, uh, the sacrifice of the, I'm the union sacrifice for question and answer. So on with the show. Any questions? I think there's some mics on the side, so please don't hesitate. Hello. Hey. Hi there. My name is Nick. I'm uh, uh, pursuing the um, MS in biodefense, one of um, Professor Koblenz's students. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to talk to us. Um, honestly, a privilege to watch you uh, speak. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on um, what the government is doing to safeguard the bioeconomy um, and your thoughts on the new emerging field of cyber, bio, cyber biosecurity and kind of where you see that field going in the next few years. So, um, well, I think there's a great issue and great interest to pr pr promote and protect the bioeconomy. And so your question kind of converges together, How, you know, because I think the greatest concern right now is around cyber biosecurity. Uh, and because really the, the coin of the realm now is sequences. And, and if you can get sequences and, or get the IP behind sequences that can do things, whether it's energy production or food production or whatever, uh, that's going to advantage somebody. So I think those are kind of side by side two critical issues. I just took a brief yesterday, uh, I won't say from the, where the institute was, was on that very topic about cyber biosecurity. And quite frankly, we have a long way to go to get to that, I think. Um, I think some of the things around uh, that has been in the public press about the risk of intellectual property um, is particularly of concern in the biology world. Um, and um, I think that's not only an interest to the federal government, but to the private sector. And that uh, these things, you know, it takes a lot of energy and effort to do this. I mean. I'm just going to say, just think about drug development and the idea that you go, that a company would go through 
several hundred million dollars of investment to get to a critical phase of, of a development and then submit an IND, for example, an investigation of the drug to the FDA and, and that somehow gets pilfered and that gets, and that becomes, that's the cookbook, right? And that becomes somebody else's property and they can basically take advantage of all that investment. So I think it's a serious challenge. I don't have the prescription for it, but I can describe the problem as something that we better get our head around. And if you're studying it, uh, you have a future young man and come see me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments, Bob. Appreciate it very much. Um, my question has to do with microbial forensics. Uh, how do you look at microbial forensics as not only a tool to reduce the risks you were talking about, but as it cuts across goals two, three, and four as a mechanism for improving surveillance and improving our ability to do attribution? Thank you. Well, I think microbial forensics are essential. I mean, there's, it's, a, it's an extension of detection and identification and characterization. The real issue is, is can we do it with the kind of certainty that we would like to have when you talk about attribution and you talk about retribution as a potentially link to that, you gotta be dang sure that not only is the science good, but the linkage of that information to a perpetrator is solid. And, and I think that I'm not in the best position to comment on that because I'm a little bit out of my field right now on that or, or away from it. But I think that's a big challenge. And the, why is it a big, a ch big challenge? Because now you're talking about the idea of CRISPR-Cas9 and things that could make attribution so much more difficult, you know, in terms of being able to identify changes in genetic sequence that would uh, give you some confidence that something was done. And then it's a matter of saying, well, who did it? And, and that requires more than just microbial forensics. That requires, you know, law enforcement, intelligence, a whole series of other things that uh, science is only one piece of that. So I can't say I'm really optimistic, but I, I do believe that that's an area of, of greater effort or intensive uh, examination. Professor, you want to say something? Within the interest of time, let's just take uh, two more questions in a row, and you can respond to both of them. Oh, great. And, and we do have a reception outside, so um, after the, the two questions, yeah. there'll be some more time to talk to Dr. Cadlett about yeah. Yeah, and you can liquor me up, and then I may even more forthcoming, right? <laughs> Go My ahead. name is Monique Van Hook. I'm a professor of School of Systems Biology here at George Mason, and I work at the Center for Biodefense and the BSL-3 labs out of Manassas. And I run a research lab focused on tularemia and also other gram-negative biothreat agents. So my question for you is sort of in regards to this biodefense enterprise, you know, and the fundamental research on these biothreat agents. It seems that more and more of my colleagues are retiring and the labs are shifting focus. And what is your sort of thoughts about how to maintain that part of the biodefense enterprise in the current difficult funding situations? Well, you know, there's, well, first of all, I just want to describe that it's not unique to, to I'd say, the biodefense community. But if you look larger at the public health community, there's a lot of graying out going on right now. And I think that's a challenge to basically bring in uh, a new uh, generation of researchers, but new generation of researchers, researchers need grants, need money to do that. So part of this is really trying to focus on the opportunities to basically invest into these areas and continue. So you can ask me, do we have a tularemia vaccine? No. Do we have the countermeasures, full range of countermeasures we need for tularemia? No. So you'd argue, and it, tularemia is a bio threat agent according to the Department of Homeland Security. So you would think that we should still be engaging in this kind of thing. I think one of the challenges, and, and this may be an artifact, that there was an explosion of funding post 9-11, and obviously that's contracting, right? Memories fade, priorities change, people change, personalities change, and I think that's one of the opportunities, I think, in realigning this biodefense strategy is to look at those, those elements to say, what do we really need? Probably we don't need 50 places doing it, but we probably need five really good ones doing it. And I think that's, that's where hopefully we'll make a contribution in the end. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, you know, the wonderful talk tonight. I was just wondering if you could touch a little bit more on um, where HHS and ASPR is going with the international uh, community with things like the North American Plan for Pandemic and Animal Influenza? Sure. Well, I think the key thing is, is 
you can't look at any of these problems in isolation as a national problem. I think one of the challenges we have is that we have a small international shop, and I'm trying to leverage a bigger international footprint uh, with a small shop. And so that's one of the challenges I'm trying to do in terms of some of my conversations with another part of HHS, the Office of Global Affairs. How can I leverage that more effectively to make sure that we're not only in those particular conversations, but broader conversations as it relates whenever health ministers meet together that we get some input into this. Uh, because quite frankly, uh, actually I'll be hosting uh, Thursday and Friday the Global Health Security Initiative with the G7 Plus to basically a, to look at some of these issues, frankly. And, and it's been an incredible, it was a creation of Tommy Thompson after 9-11 and has kind of moved along uh, with some regularity but again, some loss of zeal and focus, except for the people who actually do the work. But finding ways that we can basically leverage and sustain it in a way that really does, you know, doesn't have, it doesn't become a meeting to have a meeting, but is really about a series of collaborations to improve our ability to have confidence in what each other can bring to an outbreak, whether it be pandemic or SARS or MERS or a bioterrorism event, but more importantly, how do we work together in emergency response and management? which I think is the next level. So we have some work to do in that. Um, I'd like to think we can make a good, a good stride here in the next couple of years to kind of codify that way, which will make it both meaningful and sustainable going forward. Uh, but I can tell you right now, my international footprint is really small. And, and I'm trying to figure out how do I make it bigger uh, and how do I get force multipliers to the fight, uh, to use a military phrase. Professor? And I do kids' parties, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>